I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And now to tonight's event. Lisa Wingate is a former journalist, an inspirational speaker, and the author of numerous novels, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Before We Were Yours, which has sold more than 2.2 million copies. The co-author with Judy Christie of the nonfiction book, Before and After, Wingate is a two-time ACFW Carroll Award winner, a Christie Award nominee, an Oklahoma Book Award finalist, and a Southern Book Prize winner. She lives with her husband in North Texas. Joining Lisa tonight is Diane Clochet, a volunteer with the historic New Orleans Collection Museum. In 2015, she began assisting the museum in creating a database of historical lost friends advertisements through which formerly enslaved people desperately tried to find their lost families in the decades following emancipation. After reading Lisa Wingate's 2017 novel, Before We Were Yours, Diane wrote to Lisa about the lost friends ad saying, there is a story in each one of the ads. To date, Diane has entered over 2,500 unique ads and tens of thousands of names in the museum's database, preserving the histories of thousands of families. Diane's work and the stories of the real life lost friends inspired Lisa's newest novel, The Book of Lost Friends. And finally, Lisa's dear friend, Christy Woodson Harvey, is the best-selling author of Dear Carolina, Lies and Other Acts of Love, Slightly South of Simple, The Secret to Southern Charm, and The Southern Side of Paradise. Christy is the winner of the Lucy Bramlett Patterson Award for Excellence in Creative Writing and a finalist for the Southern Book Prize. Hello, everyone. We're so glad you're with us. Christy, I'm going to turn this show over to you. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your night, Lisa. This is so great. I'm so honored to be here. And your big night, Diane, too, not to leave you out. Um, I was, you know, just so happy to be here in general. But you guys, if you have not read the book of Lost Friends, oh my goodness, it is extraordinary. It really is. It is a magical story. And just getting to know the story behind the story, I think makes it even cooler. And so I know, you know, Lisa, you would probably agree with this as authors so often, you know, at events or through emails or letters, you know, people will come to us and say, I have a story and you need to write it. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the time that doesn't end up happening. But for the book of lost friends, that was not the case at all. And so I wanted to just start out with you, Diane, um, you know, you, reached out to Lisa and told her that you had a story for her. And so I'm just really interested to know, I mean, when you reached out to her, what did you say? And did you have a true expectation that she would end up writing a book about, you know, the lost friends? Well, I, I was, I didn't have an expectation because I wasn't even sure that she would return my email that just this random person had sent her. And so I had been working on entering all the Lost Friends ad as I had been doing for many years, volunteering with the Historic New Orleans Collection. And right at that point, and this was probably uh, over a couple of years ago, I was reading Before We Were Yours. And so I just saw such a parallel between the Lost Friends ads and the Before We Were Yours of the uh, Tennessee uh, orphan Adoption uh, agency. And so I just, and the main thing was, is when I read her dedication page, and she said that, uh, that may your stories not be forgotten. And that was something that just resonated with me because I thought with these lost friends ads and the database, these stories are not going to be forgotten. And so I just got off and I sent, I googled her name and I got an email address and I sent her an email and I think within 36 hours, along with copies of the ads and some samples, and 
I think it was in 36 hours, I had a response from Lisa. And I was running around the room, hollering and screaming and yelling. I was so excited, so, because I love the book, so. That is amazing. It really is. Um, and so Lisa, this is sort of a two-parter for you. I've heard a lot of authors say that, you know, after you have a book like Before We Were Yours, that is so, you know, unusually extraordinarily successful. Do you feel a certain amount of pressure or did you feel a certain amount of pressure to come up with a story idea that would resonate with people in that same way? And then also, you know, along those same lines, when Diane reached out to you, was this like a light bulb moment for you? You immediately knew this is something that you wanted to pursue or was it just sort of the beginning of looking into it a little bit more? Um, so on the first part, Yes, it was hard. I had finished, um, before I went on tour for Before We Were Yours, I had finished what I thought would be the next book and sort of the rough draft. And so I was working on that. And then Before We Were Yours took off and I was traveling a lot and life was pretty crazy. And so I was, I thought I had my, you know, I was in a committed relationship with that manuscript. I thought that would be the next book. And it was a piece of history I, I loved and was fascinated with and I loved the characters. And I was actually at home for a little while, sitting out on the back porch. It was a nice warm day and I was out on this green porch working and um, I was procrastinating. And I, so I went to the email instead of the manuscript and Diane's note was there. And um, I, my, my first thought was, oh, she's writing a book about this. And then I realized she was sending me the information to see, you know, if because of the parallels and to see if I was interested in, in learning more to write a book. And I, I, I read the ads she had attached and then I sort of tumbled down the well of these ads and it was like these people whose names quite likely exist nowhere on the earth anymore. Um, you know, most of these people were probably buried in, in graves that were not marked or are not marked anymore. Um, you know, it's generations down the line, their stories are gone from the earth. And it was, it, these people were just rising up out of the ground and sitting there on the porch with me telling their stories. And, you know, I just read ad after ad and story of family after family. And I was, you know, I was fascinated. I mean, I, I thought, um, here, here are the stories of what happened to these people, and they've been gone, tucked away in some museum file drawer or the archives at some college or um, the back room of some library that happened to have these old, old newspapers. And this museum and this volunteer, this woman is doing this volunteer, um, gather these together and put them on this form of communication that these people could not possibly have imagined. And their stories begin to travel around the world, you know, and as an author, I mean, you know, Christy, as an author, some things just kind of blow your mind wide open. And those are the things that you just start thinking, how would you tell this story? Who would tell this story, et cetera. So um, I knew I wanted to, I knew I was fascinated. I knew I wanted to write about it. Um, right when I first heard about it, I just thought it would be my next, next book. I thought I would finish the book I was working on and go on and do this one next. That's amazing. So were you um, in communication with Diane, like as you were beginning to brainstorm the story and form the idea for it? So uh, what, what happened in those first months, because, you know, I told Diane, I'm, I'm interested, you know, I'm I'm going to learn more. I'm putting this in my idea chest, et cetera. But like I said, I thought I was going to finish up the manuscript I was, I was working on. And so a few months went by spring into summer sort of, and, um, you know, and it just kept haunting me. And every so often Diane would send me these, these lovely little emails with these packages of attachments that would be, um, some of it was documentation from her husband's family who were Southern and had owned a plantation and there's more of a story there. Some of them were research she had done into their own family. Um, some of them were lost friends ads as she was entering them. She'd come across ones that just really struck her. And 
I just got a little deeper and more attached every time. So, um, and every piece of information that would come. And so by summer, I knew I wanted to write this story next. Um, the other book, the other manuscript was due. It was already on contract with my publisher. Um, everything, you know, was in the works. And so my agent and I just went to the publisher and said, you know, we think, um, which goes back a little bit to your question about what should be next. And, you know, did you feel a lot of pressure for what should come next? And we just, you know, we all agreed that this should be next. I love that. That's incredible. So Diane, I'm just so interested from your end. I mean, how did you get involved in this project and what sort of sparked your interest in, um, you know, entering these ads in this database and reading them? Like, how did you get involved with that in the first place? Uh, I had previously worked uh, with a historic New Orleans collection and then I came back as a volunteer and I, they had an exhibit called Purchase Lives, the Domestic Slave Trade in New Orleans, which opened in uh, 2015. And so that's where most of this information was coming from, is to, to work with the exhibit also that we would uh, put up these Lost Friends ads. So it started with, well, here are a few ads and go ahead and get them in and we can get the database started. And there were just incredible people that had gone out and photographed all of these ads, plus the people that developed the database through the Historic New Orleans Collection. And so uh, it would just be, I would go in a couple of days a week and enter ads, and I found out when I did that it was very time consuming and that I would have one ad, but with that ad, I would have to break it down by date and all the counties and states listed and then the names of the slave owners and the lost friends they were looking for, the, the uh, people that had placed the ads and then the lost friends and family they had been looking for. So it really involved about reading one ad at least five to 10 times to be able to get all the information that had to be posted. And uh, it was so emotionally draining. I, if I got 30 done in a day, it was probably a good day, but, and then I just had to walk away from it, but it was, um, it was a process, but it all tied in with the Purchase Lives exhibit that the Historic New Orleans Collection put together. Yes. Wow. That is incredible. Um, and so, Lisa, I'm assuming that, you know, you could have told this story from any number of different viewpoints, or you could have chosen, you know, a lot of different lives to have written about, a lot of different time periods to have written about, but you chose these two really unforgettable characters, the formerly enslaved Hanny Gossett, who's coming of age during Reconstruction, and then a young teacher, Benny Silva, in 1987, who stumbles across connections to Hanny's story. So what made you decide on these particular viewpoints and these particular time periods, especially, you know, 1987? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you, you probably have the feeling sometimes that you didn't decide on characters, they decided on you um, when you start to, you know, your first thought as a fiction writer, and for me, you know, if you're dealing with the history or even in contemporary, if there's a situation you want to talk about or whatever, you know, your first question is who would tell the story? Like, what eyes would you look at it through? And, um, and in this case, in this story, uh, I, I knew the the historic part would be 1870s um, for the purposes of the ages of the girls and when the Civil War ended, I, I actually backed up a little bit into 18, to 75. Um, so right, you know, we're in that post reconstruction period. Um, we're 10 years past the war basically. And um, I, I knew it would be a trio of girls who come who are interrelated, but from very different circumstances, because what you learn, especially New Orleans has this fascinating history and some of the way the book is set up came out of the history, but there's a fascinating history in New Orleans of um, the plantation owners. A lot of them had families because of the French history of the area. Many of them had what they called left-hand families. They kept down in New Orleans, which were uh, biracial, uh, multiracial women whom they kept, who lived in style in neighborhoods down in New Orleans 
and they raised whole families together. And many of them sent these what were called placage uh, children off um, to Europe for education and so forth. And so I you know, was fascinated with the history of the area, um, wanted to include that in the story. So I knew it would be these three girls. I didn't know who would tell the story, but it quickly became clear that Hanny was the one with the story to tell because the book is about the lost friends ads and what they meant to these families who had had no hope of ever finding their families. Like, I mean, you imagine, um, you know, probably the closest thing that, that we in modern day can relate to it is, um, is after 9-11, when everyone was posting those pictures. People who could not find their families were posting those pictures and saying, there, have you seen this person? You know, because, um, and that's kind of the situation these people were in. Um, and these newspaper ads went out into the world and they hoped that they would find their people that way. Uh, in 1987, um, I wanted to back up a little bit closer to, uh, to where you would have generations who were just one generation removed from slavery, who would have known um, grandparents who remembered being enslaved. And so um, in 1987, uh, it may come as a surprise, but I remember 1987 quite well. Um, I know, I know it doesn't show, but I was there in 1987 and uh, that's when I graduated from high school. So it was a year I could remember really well. And in a way the 80s seem a little more innocent. The 70s were very controversial and raucous and, you know, the 80s were kind of this, um, it just, it seemed like it, they, a lot of the strife took a, took a, a decade off kind of in the 80s. And, you know, MTV was starting and all these, you know, it was just kind of a cool time to go back to. Um, so the 1987, the teacher, um, just a little bit of a, a little bit of 80s love there, I think, you know, wind pants and um, parachute clothes and all that good stuff. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, the 80s are a great decade. I mean, I can't think of anything of a better time to write about. So um, that's really interesting, though. I mean, that that makes a lot of sense, you know, thinking about, you know, having grandparents who could have those memories and those stories. And so, Diane, I wanted to go back to you. Um, you know, we get to see a lot of these Lost Friends ads in Lisa's novel. And so I'm just, I'm interested, you know, have you come across any success stories from these families? I mean, they were obviously very you know, desperate to find these family members. And do you, do you know if any of these people actually, you know, found their families or found their friends in the end? Well, um, that's a question that's always asked. And I, in the database, there were probably between maybe 15 to 20 ads that were called found friends. So out of almost 3,000 ads, there were, that was the number that I had. But then you have to realize, too, that for someone to place an ad, it costs 50 cents to do that. And so that was a lot of money. And, and I'm hopeful that maybe more people connected, but this didn't have the money to be able to say thank you in the newspaper like they had wanted to do. But it's um, we did get a letter I'm trying, I don't remember the exact date of it, maybe about eight or nine months ago, uh, the director of the Stuart New Orleans Collection got a uh, letter from the descendants of the Georgetown University uh, enslaved people that had been sold off at Georgetown and brought south. And there was a big group uh, that came down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And we heard from one of the group, and I'm getting goosebumps talking about it, but they were able to connect directly to five of the people that they were missing. And so that was just, that just was just wonderful information to get. And I'm so hopeful with these ads that, you know, and with Lisa's book that will draw more people to the database and there will be more connections and we will provide that, you know, for other people, so. That must, that's incredible. It must be yeah. very rewarding for both of you. And I hope that you have lots of success. Um, all right, so Wanda, do you want to do some more questions or do you want to go to the, the q and I'm watching our time. <laughs> <laughs> 
we are going to go to the audience and get okay. their questions. Okay. It is time for questions. <laughs> it's important you stay muted so we can all hear. And remember to put a capital L for Lisa, a capital D for Diane in front of your questions. Name your local store if you'd like. And Linda Marie is going to be sorting through and asking the questions from the chat. Linda Marie, do we have a question? Oh, you're muted. Linda Sorry about that. <laughs> it's evening time. Yeah. <laughs> This, uh, this is a question for Lisa from a, a fan of Copperfish Books in Punta Gorda, Florida. They love the character of Gus. Can you talk about his role in your novel? Oh, Gus McClatchy. Um, you know, I never know who will, who will show up in a book, but because uh, one of the interesting things in Hanny's story, this or a story of um, Hanny and Juno Jane and Missy as they um, travel from... Louisiana to Texas on kind of this odyssey epic journey. One of the hard things to research, but one of the fascinations was just how you would get from here to there in that day and age, uh, because it, 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 was, it would be part riverboat, part train, part on foot or by wagon. Uh, there, there was not an easy way to get uh, from South Louisiana out into the wilds of Texas in that time period. And so as in researching riverboats, of course, um, I was reading a lot of Mark Twain's accounts of his life on the river, interviews that had been done with him, et cetera. And one of the things he had done as a seven-year-old boy, it was in an old, old um, article that you don't see much, but I unearthed it somewhere in the research. He had uh, stowed away on a riverboat. He, he, he you know, was dying to be on a boat, get on a boat. So at seven years old, he stows away under the lifeboats on a riverboat and um, happened to be where the cinders floating out of the stack were, were getting him the whole time. And in other words, it was not a pleasant experience, but he made it a few miles down the river before they discovered him and put him off and, I, and somebody called for his parents to come get him. But, uh, but that gave me the idea for uh, Gus McClatchy, this young stowaway, uh, who helps Hanny figure out the way of the river, basically, and how to get by stowed away on a riverboat. And um, I don't want to give away too much, but um, so Gus is kind of a, a shout out to, some, uh, to, to Mark Twain to that idea of being a young boy who takes to the river to try to survive. He is one of my favorite happenstance characters who just walked into the story um and i i loved him and um i loved catching up with him a little bit in the end i won't say anymore that because i want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it but i didn't know he would have a little something to say in the end of the book or, or we would hear a little more about him so i was so happy when it happened i don't i people often ask if i know exactly what will happen in a book and stuff i have a rough idea but a lot of it just it's the magic of story. It just happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is for Diane. Have you put your database onto any of the genealogy databases for families who are doing ancestry research? Um, I, I can't answer that question directly, and, but I'm almost sure we have not done that yet. Uh, there still needs to be some polishing, you know, with some of it, and um, it would be up to the Historic New Orleans Collection, you know, to make that decision. It's not like it's my database, but it's um, it's it's available for anybody online with hnoc.org. So yes, and it has. They have. Um, they also continue to find and have continued to find new groups of ads and add them in. So new, every so often I'll hear either from Diane or from um, Jess at the museum that they found some new lost friends and brought them home to join the database. Diane, several people have asked about the museum where it's located in New Orleans. Uh, yes, it's located in the French Quarter. Uh, it is called the Historic New Orleans Collection at 520 Royal Street. 
and they just have a new building that they opened across the street in the Brulator Historic Building. And then there's the Williams Research Center that's at 410 Charter Street in the French Quarter also. So it's a wonderful place to visit, wonderful for research, library, publications. I know I'm leaving things out, touring of the buildings, but, and wonderful. And you can check out their website. Yes, they have a great website stuff. too that you can look at right now, even if you can't travel there and go to the museum. Correct. Yeah. Um, Lisa, this is from a fan of writing books on St. Simon's Island. And they want to know if you'll be going back to the book that you dropped. If you're oh. going back to that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the book that I dropped, I will. It was a piece of history I loved. Um, but, but, you know, like I said, I had written it in the time before, before We Were Yours came out and um, it, it, the Lost Friends came along and, and stole me away. Uh, but yes, I, it is definitely a story I want to tell. It's a piece of history I love. I will go back to it. A few people who were um, on the tour and happened to ask that question early on heard me talk about that next book and what it was about. And um, and so, and it wasn't the lost friends. So yeah, I, I will definitely go back to it. No work is ever wasted. Um, it just, sometimes it's, it's delayed. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, a fan of the Midlothian Book Exchange in Richmond, Virginia asks, where do you like to write? Uh, I it can, people, people used to ask me um, years ago, I, this is book number 32 for me for the book of lost friends um so i've been at it a long time people used to ask you know, do you need a quiet place to write and where do you write and uh, you know the reality was i wrote a lot of those books while i had little little kids and so i wrote at soccer practice i wrote in the carpool line i wrote when boys were tearing through the house with their friends i did you know if i waited for quiet to write i would have never written a thing uh, I can I can write anywhere, and when the boys were little, there I have big hairy legged man children now. They're grown, um, <laughs> but when they were little, you know, they used to joke about how many times they would have to say "mom, mom, 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 mom" before I would come out of the brain world and rejoin them in the real world. Uh, but I so I write everywhere. I, I I work with a laptop. I am I love the porch. I love to be what they call, uh, over in Europe, they call it forest bathing. I love to be forest bathing as I'm writing. If I can, I love to be outdoors and just are on the screen porch and enjoy the breeze and enjoy um, just the feeling and sound of being outside. But I, I can write literally anywhere. Um, in, the, in the latter years, one of my favorite things to do is just write by vacation on my iPhone. So you know, I might go for a walk and write, uh, or I may write when I'm on the elliptical exercising. I, I, I can write anywhere and I can also procrastinate anywhere. So. <laughs> um, a viewer who is an East Texas native loved the feature of Jefferson and the trek to Fort Worth. And they wonder, do you travel to locations to write about them or do you write solely from research? Both. Um, so the great thing about writing this book, of course, is I'm a Texan. And so it, it, it's, it's always nice to write in your own backyard um, because I know some things about those towns, not that it didn't take a lot of research to find out uh, in, in that day and time. I spent a lot of time with old railroad maps, old river maps, you know, maps of old roads, because you can't assume uh, for instance, um, there's a Powell Town, Texas mentioned in the story. It's not named that anymore. You can't, even if a town was there and you go through it and it looks like an old town and buildings say, you know, 1882 or 1865 or whatever, you don't know that the town was named that back, back then. So you, you have to get old maps. You have to go back to old documents and make sure. Um, so the Texas part, there was a lot of that figuring out, I knew Jefferson was a port, but you, you have to figure out in what years and how much traffic was there and what would you do after you got to Jefferson? How did you go on from there and um, whatnot? Louisiana, um, I will often write from whatever knowledge I have of the place, from Google Earth, from 
um, research and then go to the place because when I go do the location research, then I know what I need to know. I know what I need to know more about. And so um, after the manuscript was done in rough, I went to Louisiana and um, went down along the river road and did uh, the Whitney plantation tour, which is the one plantation down there that's dedicated to the, the enslaved, to the experience of the enslaved people rather than to the plantation culture, et cetera. Um, did a swamp tour, you know, did a lot of the things I needed to do for actual hands-on location research down there. When did my way back up? Did the Cane River um, National Historic Park um, and then uh, landed at the Ploche Hacienda <laughs> and um, visited with Diane and Andy and Jess from the Historic New Orleans Collection walked their grounds, um, spent a lot of time looking through their documents, took a bunch of Diane's, uh, their family documents home with me. Um, I think I slept with them in the bed with me on the way home because I was so afraid of losing them. And, uh, and I was sort of terrified to FedEx them back. But so that's kind of, so it's both. It's both. I, I like to go to a place because you don't, there's just things you don't know unless you can be there. Continue on with questions. Okay. Um, another person asks if you could share about your process or choices when using fictional or factual details and characters. So this, so most of my stories are some blend of fact and fiction, especially the ones dealing with history. Um, and so there are people um, in the story who are based on real people. There are certainly places that are real places. Uh, there are stories in those places that are real. Um, uh, there are characters who are based on real people. It, I would, well, there's a couple stories I can't tell because I'd spoil it for anybody who hasn't read the book. Um, uh, it, one, for instance, um, the one character in the story, um, Elam Salter is based on a real character who was a deputy, uh, deputy federal marshal, had been an enslaved person, escaped, went to Indian territory, knew how to speak all the Indian languages, or had learned how to speak quite a few of the Native, Native American languages, um, and became a very famous deputy because he could go up into Indian territory and track out laws and things. And um, he was someone I just came across as I was doing the research. And I thought, what a fascinating life story this man had. So the real character, be, or the real man, Bass Reeves, became the basis for a fictional character. So that that's what happens a lot in the stories is a lot of the people are based on real people. Um, I don't know that you're meeting any real people by name in the story. You're meeting a lot of people who are based on historical research. Certainly the people Haney comes along um, on her journey as she's um, finding people who are looking for their lost families. They are based on either lost friends ads or um, I read hundreds of the slave narratives that were written during the depression by the WPA federal writers who went out and interviewed the last people who remembered uh, slavery firsthand. And um, so a lot of the, the stories Hanny comes across and other people are actually based on uh, the real life slave narratives. Mm -hmm. Linda Marie, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, you often write books you often write books that are in a series. Do you think that there will be other books related to the characters in this book? Oh, wow. Um, I, I never know for sure, but I don't think so. Um, I, I never know for sure. Every once in a while, a character crops back up and I just have to tell a story about them. But uh, but I don't know, there are so many other pieces of history, uh, little nuggets of amazing stories that I want to tell that I don't know that I'll circle back around and, and retell or tell further stories 
about the people in the last few books. Well, Lisa, we want you to tell them too. So <laughs> thank you. Keep it up. Thank you, Lisa, Diane, Christy, and thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. And if you enjoyed it as much as I did, let your bookstore know by ordering Lisa's book. Be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions for how this could be better and order the book of lost friends from them. And thanks to Linda Marie and Nikki. This is Wanda signing off. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me.